Good evening. My name is Peter Christian Agner. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. My pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. If this is your first time with us, I invite you to learn more about the Gotham Center at gothamcenter.org, where you can find hundreds of podcasts, recorded interviews, panel discussions, essays, book reviews, digital exhibits, and more on all things New York City history. Those of you looking for a more intensive learning experience may also be interested in our new online education program, Gotham Ed, which offers many courses with leading experts and scholars on a wide range of topics at convenient times to friendly prices. You can see our current menu at gothamed.com. With that said, I'm delighted to introduce our guest this evening. who will be discussing this excellent new book, Left in the Center, The Liberal Party of New York and the Rise and Fall of American Social Democracy, recently published by Cornell University Press. Social democracy is not a familiar term in America, where you are more likely to be described as progressive or very liberal if your politics are left wing. We remain uniquely among the rich democratic nations, the only two party system, the only country that does not have a formal labor or socialist party that is competitive nationally. In the social democracies like Denmark and the Netherlands, many parties compete in elections and the social democrats have arguably defined the center of political gravity since roughly the mid 20th century. That period after World War II has been called, quote, the social democratic moment to connote the dramatic political shift that occurred across Western Europe and in other wealthy industrial nations. Although we remain an outlier in most respects, a similar real realignment occurred in the United States with FDR's New Deal, which among other things, dramatically increased the working class share of the Democratic Party's electorate and brought union figures into line with those of some of the largest Western European countries for the first time. Leaders of major unions even began exploring the idea of a national social democratic workers party in the early Truman years, taking the labor party in post-war England as their model. One of those unions was the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the largest union in New York City, which gathered under the aegis of the liberal party with the expectation of serving as a left-wing anchor, keeping alive the social democratic spirit of the New Deal in the late 1940s. During a time when most third parties shrank, they remained easily the most successful third party in the nation, serving, serving often in the later decades as kingmaker in the election of not just mayors and governors, but senators and presidents, essential to the success, the, essential to the success of both democratic reformers and liberal Republicans. It became a model for New York's influential conservative party established in the early 1960s to dethrone the likes of Nelson Rockefeller and John Lindsay, who pulled the GOP leftward nationally. And it was the example for the later Working Families Party, too, created to serve a, a goal not unlike the Liberal Party's original purpose. Unlike those parties, however, which have inspired several monographs, the Liberals have yet to receive their due until now. In part because, in part perhaps, uh, because by the end, they came to be viewed, uh, viewed as a cynical patronage machine a question for our guest. But in this new book from Daniel Sawyer, we finally have a thorough and long overdue account of this party's complicated and very important legacy to the history of New York City. Daniel Sawyer is a professor of history at Fordham University at Rose Hill in the Bronx, where he teaches a variety of courses on the ethnic and political history of New York City and the United States. Although this is technically his first book, he is the co-author and co-editor of several works, including most notably Jewish New York, a single volume iteration of the authoritative three-part series on the subject published by New York University Press. He's also published dozens of articles exploring this history in various scholarly research journals and has served as the co-editor of American Jewish history for the last five years. He's been a frequent reviewer of books and film, helped curate a half dozen exhibits and has advised on numerous public history ventures as well and for several research institutes. I'm very happy to welcome him back, welcome him back to the Gotham Center. It's also my distinct pleasure to introduce our discussant this evening, Mika Sifri, a writer and editor with decades of experience in activism on matters of democracy. He is the co-founder of Civic Hall, a collaborative that seeks to build the power and capacity of civic-minded people and organizations with the use of new technologies, and has published several books on this subject, including Civic Tech in the Global South, A Lever and a Place to Stand, How Civic Tech Can Move the World, and The Big Disconnect, Why the Internet Hasn't Transformed Politics Yet. He is a regular contributor to the American Prospect, the New Republic, and the Nation, where he served for a time as associate editor. 
He, is the, he was the editorial director of Personal Democracy Media, an institution he co-founded in 2004, and currently writes a newsletter on democracy movements, organizing and tech called The Connector. He is also the author of Spoiling for a Fight, Third Party Politics in America, a book which explores the rise of third parties like the Working Families Party here in New York over the past few decades. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel now, who's going to provide a brief overview of his book before Mika leads us in conversation. But first, just the usual tiny bit of housekeeping. As usual, uh, discussion will last until 7.30 or so, at which point we'll take your questions. If at any time you have questions, I, I encourage you to send those in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We have disabled the chat function, as always, out of respect to our speakers. And with that, please join me in welcoming our esteemed speakers with a bit of silent applause. Thank you, uh, Peter, and uh, thank you uh, not only for the introduction, but for having me here, and thank you to the Gotham Center and to Micha for participating in this. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, anyone who has voted in New York State knows that uh, we have here a multi-party system, which is unusual for the United States. In addition to the, the big parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, there have been several minor parties that actually play an important role in New York politics. So uh, Peter mentioned the Conservative Party and the Working Families Party, which are still around, uh, which play important roles. Um, and there have been others before that, and one of them was the Liberal Party. Uh, the, reason, the reason why these parties are able to have an, an, an influence, even though they're small, is that New York State allows uh, what is called, sometimes called fusion voting, sometimes called cross endorsement. Basically, it's one of the few states that allows a candidate to be the candidate of more than one party at a time. So when you go into the voting booth, uh, you'll see um, the offices and the parties and um, someone like uh, Joe Biden can be the, the candidate for president of both the Democratic Party and the Working Families Party. You can vote for him on either row or either column and uh, the votes get combined uh, for, the, for his total vote. Uh, this gives leverage to the small parties um, who can either offer their support or withhold their support from a major party candidate. Um, there was one liberal party activist in the, in the 1960s who put it this way. He said, statewide, in a statewide election, we cannot guarantee a Democrat that he will win if we support him, but we can guarantee that he will lose if we don't support him, okay? Uh, and I would say that in New York City, for a long time, it was the opposite. It was for Republicans um, necessary to have Liberal Party support if they had any chance of winning uh, citywide. So this gives, you know, the, the small parties can go to the bigger parties, or the bigger party candidates and say, you know, you have to support us in certain ways. You have to uh, take certain positions on the issues if you want our support. Um, and this allows the parties to inject a little bit of a kind of ideological element into New York politics that doesn't oh, that doesn't exist most places in the United States. Uh, Peter mentioned that um, you know the corollary, corollary to the Liberal Party were like the Social Democratic parties of Europe, and they were actually quite conscious of this, and they had relationships with uh, Social Democratic parties in Europe and uh, things like the Cooperative Commonwealth Party in Canada, the forerunner of the New Democratic Party. Um, so the book is about the Liberal Party. It was one of the longest lasting and effective of these small New York State parties. It was founded in 1944 and it went out of business in 2002. Um, in that period, it helped to elect mayors of the country's largest city, uh, governors, senators, and even presidents. 
and it served as the explicit model for the Conservative Party, the Working Families Party that are still around today. Um, it was, I think, the longest lasting, but now I think the Conservative Party, which was founded in 1962, has edged it out. Um, the party played an important role in maintaining, building, first of all, and maintaining what a number of historians have called New York's unusual, if not unique, social democracy, uh, social democracy in one city, um, in, you know, unusual for the United States. So um, people like Josh Freeman have talked about this and others, uh, but P Freeman, for example, mentions the Liberal Party, but he doesn't really go into it. Uh, Mason Williams in his great book about um, the relationship between um, uh, uh, between LaGuardia and uh, FDR in the 30s, the, uh, you know, kind of building this New York social democracy, mentions at the beginning the role that socialists played in this kind of left New Deal coalition. But then he kind of dropped, they drop out of the discussion altogether, progressive Republicans through LaGuardia and liberal Democrats through FDR remain. Um, many historians, I think of New York, have been very taken by the communists who played a role in New York and their, what used to be called fellow travelers, especially in the American Labor Party. Uh, but left out of the story of this New York social democracy are actual social Democrats. That is kind of moderate uh, socialists or people come out of a socialist tradition making compromises with a free enterprise system, but still interested in uh, kind of a government maintained um, and sponsored social uh, set of social policies, which enable working class and people and people of limited means to live a comfortable kind of life. Uh, and, an added aspect of that is, uh, you know, often very anti-communist, uh, anti-Soviet. Um, and so these people are left out of this talk about all of this talk about New York social democracy. What about the actual social Democrats? Uh, well, that's one, of, that's, you know, one of the reasons why I was interested in writing this book because the Liberal Party was made up of these kinds of, of people. Um, you know, uh, some people are interested in the joy of sects, uh, S-E-C-T-S. Um, it can get kind of um, esoteric at times, but New York is interesting because actually, the, you know, people come out of left-wing sects and, and the politics of these sects actually pay, play a role in real politics in New York. I mean, even the communists had upwards of 30,000 members and they could actually you know, play uh, a role in local elections. Um, and then of, of course, my own interest in, has been in uh, immigrant, in the history of uh, Jewish immigrants in New York, Yiddish speaking Jewish immigrants in New York. And actually the liberal party comes out of this milieu of the Yiddish speaking um, Jewish immigrant labor movement in New York in kind of, earlier decades of the 20th century in New York. Um, and it outlasted that milieu, but it shows that that milieu had actually a lasting impact on general politics in the city. Um, but then, as Peter also mentioned, towards the end of the party's history, um, well, it kind of degenerated in a lot of ways. Um, and there was this quip that uh, that starts to appear in a lot of the newspapers and magazines about the Liberal Party. You know, they say just like the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, the Liberal Party is neither liberal nor a party. Rather, it's a um, law firm with a ballot line, um, maybe really a um, uh, a lobbying firm with a ballot line, something like that. It had, um, and some would could say, some would say it was just a corrupt patronage machine. It had no real social base. 
uh, no real concern for ideology, um, just concern for jobs for its people. And that was about it. Um, so, you know, what's something that started out as a real um, yeah, social, I mean, you could argue that it was, a, it was, it certainly had a, so, whether it was a social movement or not, it was a real party with real people. Uh, it could mobilize thousands of people for meeting, for rallies, uh, for work in the elections. It had a real social base in, especially the garment unions, uh, in Jewish uh, neighborhoods in New York, working class and middle class Jewish neighborhoods. By the end, it was um, kind of nothing much, right? Um, and so, you know, there's some lessons. Like, what, what, what's the lesson here, right? Uh, so maybe to anticipate a little bit the discussion, certainly one thing is the changing meaning of liberalism. This kind of social democratic, social democratic liberalism starts to seem kind of outdated and out of style by the 1960s, certainly by the 1970s. Um, there, there was always something about the Liberal Party which bothered some people, which it was it was trying to balance a kind of ideological like I, politics and I, a certain kind of idealism with a certain kind of practicality, right? Pragmatism. It was often backing candidates that um, did not fully agree with its um, ideology or with its even with its position. It had to decide what's you know what's the lip, litmus test for this uh, this election, right? I don't know if you hear uh, my roommate here, the cat, but um, it's just coming through. Um, and and then the other thing, and so there's always this, you know, there's always the tension of like, you know, how much do we compromise? We know what we want, but and we know we can't always get it, right? But how much do we compromise? And then there's the importance of a real social base. I mean, part of the decline of the Liberal Party had to do with ch changes in the city, right? Uh, that meant that the people who it had always relied on um, for support weren't actually there anymore and it did not fully adjust. Um, so, you know, these are, uh, you know, I started the book uh, a while ago, but, you know, and certainly in recent years with the insurgence, those kind of socialist insurgency within the Democratic Party, I think all of these questions uh, become very, very relevant uh, for, um, you know, uh, current day politics. So that's where I'll that's where I'll you know leave off my introduction here. Thank you, Daniel. That that was really great. And uh, let me just say, first off, congratulations on getting uh, the book done. It is a major work of scholarship. Um, I learned an enormous uh, amount reading it uh, and enjoyed it a lot. Um, and um, you know, highly recommend it to uh, both. Uh, people who are interested in in um, uh, if you're a New Yorker uh, and you know at all uh, uh, engaged politically um, on the progressive side or not, um, the, there's so much rich uh, history here of uh, you know basically the last I guess from the 30s through uh, almost to the present. Um, and um, you know, it was it was a lot of fun going back through that. Uh, and I think the book also um, is timely and relevant for anybody uh, who uh, is still wrestling with that perennial question of um, how do you change the direction of politics in America? And does uh, a independent third party um, you know, can that be a vehicle for doing that? Historically, third parties uh, were um, the norm uh, all over the country um, until the late 1800s, uh, when the practice of fusion was essentially outlawed just about everywhere except New York. Um, and that happened uh, in part because reformers wanted to uh, clamp down on corruption. 
Uh, there was rampant vote buying because we didn't have the secret ballot. Parties printed their own ballots um, and then gave them to supporters and they could see who carried what ballot into the, into the ballot booth um, and often would be paid uh, you know, to vote for a particular party's line. But because parties printed their own ballots, inherently they were already doing fusion. Um, and it was the adoption of reforms like the secret ballot, which then put the state in charge of, of deciding how ballots were designed and what parties and what candidates could be on ballots that then led both the Republican and Democratic parties in different states to outlaw cross endorsement, choking off threats uh, like the populist uh, uh, party, most, most importantly, but other smaller parties that um, were important uh, through the turn of the century. New York didn't do that. And so, you know, we have a history in New York of, uh, I, I think when I wrote my book on third parties, it was roughly 20% uh, of the statewide vote um, for things like governor or other statewide seats would show up on third party lines. Um, so we've always had this complicated uh, uh, inside outside kind of uh, um, situation um, playing out in different ways in New York. Um, and I think what one of the things you do with the book um, is you retrieve for people um, who may not know about the origins in the early years of the Liberal Party, um, what it was when it was, in fact, uh, a significant social democratic uh, semi-independent force uh, for, as, as one of its leaders put it, social justice and straight government or clean government. Um, uh, again, context matters a lot. Um, I think the idea uh, that, you know, you have to start with understanding that Tammany Hall Democrats were seen as so corrupt that lots of thinking people who wanted uh, uh, to improve the, the life of ordinary people in the city uh, just didn't want to have anything to do with the Democratic Party. Um, and uh, the liberals arose out of, in part, that uh, dynamic. Um, later, when the Democratic Party gets its own reform movement, um, starting in the late 50s, early 60s, you begin to see the liberals lose some of their raison d'etre because the Democrats are not nearly as bad as they used to be. The other thing that uh, I think is so unusual and interesting to uh, reflect on is how the Liberal Party, unlike the Working Families Party of today, had two major parties that it was comfortable dancing with. Um, and that actually was a, a, a source of tremendous leverage uh, because um, they were at times quite happy fusing with liberal Republicans like LaGuardia, later Nelson Rockefeller, Jacob Javits. Um, this is a breed of Republican that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, I suppose you could imagine the never Trump uh, Republicans um, uh, uh, telling, uh, you know, they could in, indeed be the people today uh, who might uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I see some people are joining just now. Uh, uh, at, at, I, I think we may have had a little screw up on the open, the timing of the uh, <laughs> opening of the event. Uh, well, if you're just joining us now, as I can see people are, um, welcome. You are here for uh, Gotham Center conversation uh, between me and Daniel Sawyer on his his great new book, Left uh, Left in the Center. Um, the um, what I, I I wanted to start out in in um, asking you, Daniel, if you would just reflect a little bit on uh, the first years, the you know maybe the first decades of the Liberal Party when. It came out of a split on the left um, with uh, socialists, communists, and something called the American Labor Party. And basically the American Labor Party 
cracked open at the end of uh, the 30s, I guess, over uh, the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, and basically seeing the communists kind of basically move en masse based on whatever was the party line, literally, about uh, how to relate to fascism, um, that that was unpalatable to people with maybe socialist inclinations, but who just didn't want to have anything to do with the communists. And so instead of continuing to fight them inside the American Labor Party, they broke off. Um, that I think is a really important sort of to the Liberal Party's DNA, that it was always anti-communist. Um, and that later in the 50s, unfortunately, so, so much so that it was willing to go along with things like um, state laws banning uh, teachers from public schools uh, if they were uh, affiliated with the Communist Party. That doesn't seem very liberal to me in any capital L or small L definition, but of course I have a different uh, uh, sense of this. Um, so in its early years though, the Liberal Party, the, the other thing that you really bring forth quite clearly is how much it was the, the, the main political expression of immigrant Jews in New York. Um, and as one who, you know, hails from, uh, my father grew up in, in uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan and, and uh, was a teacher, my wife's family as well. Um, it really struck very close to home to read about, in some ways, my forebears. Um, and I had not realized how much the Liberal Party was, um, uh, you know, rooted in things like the Yiddish speaking immigrant population in the garment centers. Um, but that obviously changes, right? So we have both the founding in this kind of break with the communists, and then we also have the founding rooted in the struggles of the first generation of largely immigrant Jews. And then take us forward a little bit. That starts to break apart when? In the 50s, the early 60s, roughly, when does the party start to lose that kind of rootedness? It starts to lose it, I would say, in the, in the 60s. Uh, but I actually got, I want to push it back a little bit, actually, mm -hmm. because you, you talked about the origins of the party, too. So, um, you know, I actually start the book in 1886, which the, power, the party was founded in 1944. Mm -hmm. So why 1886? Because, well, it was one of these third parties in the 19th century that you were mentioning, uh, it was the Union Labor Party, and the candidate for mayor was uh, the radical economist Henry George, um, and he brought all kinds of radicals into, into his campaign. He was not a socialist, but many socialists, um, uh, many socialists uh, supported him, and they did very well. He, did, he didn't win, uh, but he came in a pretty strong second, and they were very impressed by this, and they really hoped that this would be the kind of nucleus of a real kind of mass party. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. But uh, some of the people who uh, were involved in that campaign from the Yiddish speaking Jewish immigrant community uh, remembered it as like a great moment, you know? And, you know, this is, a, this is very much reading a lot between the lines, but in some ways they were trying to reconstruct this for the next, you know, half century, right? Um, for a short peer, period of time, the Socialist Party in New York seemed like it in itself, it could be a vehicle for electoral uh, influence. Uh, between 1914 and 1922, or I think the last ones when, well, the last ones were elected in 1920, or I think something like that, uh, the Socialist Party elected um, one congressman from the Lower East Side, Meyer London, uh, and a, a number of state legislators and uh, members of the New York City Board of Aldermen and one municipal judge. And um, they were all from the Jewish immigrant districts, Lower East Side, Brownsville, uh, Bronx, and so on. Um, but that came to an end for a number of reasons. One was uh, gerrymandering, which we hear a lot about today. 
uh, and simply cut Brownsville into several districts, you know. Um, the other one, however, was um, uh, a kind of civil war within the immigrant Jewish left um, uh, between the communists and the socialists, right? And this raged throughout the 1920s in the garment unions uh, and uh, in parts of the Jewish uh, labor movement, not the unions, but uh, the like fraternal orders like the Workmen's Circle and, um, you know, kind of the newspaper world between the Socialist Forward and the Communist Freiheit. And so, and it was very, very, very bitter as civil wars, as again, something we can see can be, right? Um, so, uh, and the significance of this is that some of the uh, top leaders of the Liberal Party later on cut their teeth in these civil wars within the ILGWU and also as it happens within the Hatters Union. Um, Alex Rose uh, came out of the Hatters Union. And they were, um, you know, they came out of these battles convinced that the communists were, had uh, nearly wrecked the, the labor movement in New York. And also, you know, many uh, people came out with this, with the sense that, you know, the communists, which is absolutely true, supported a very brutal uh, dictatorship and not only supported it, but followed its lead. So um, there were there were very bitter divisions. Mm. But then another thing happens as well in the 30s. By the 30s, um, the Socialist Party actually took a turn left. Um, but many of these New York Jewish labor uh, socialists uh, were very practical people. And they start to look at the New Deal and they say, first of all, this is helping organize workers. Um, and especially, you know, the with the, uh, the, even as early as the NRA helped to establish order in industries, which was a, a perennial problem in the garment industry, which was very chaotic and broken up into thousands of little firms. And this was helping the unions establish order uh, under a union um, kind of regime, right? So, and they start to say, you know, and then a little bit later on, they start to see things like, well, yeah, I mean, it's not exactly socialism, but I mean, what's wrong with the old age pensions? What's wrong with unemployment insurance? These are things we've been fighting for for decades, right? Um, and so people like uh, Abraham Kahan, who was the editor of The Forward, he actually at one point, um, well, actually pretty early on at a, at a rally, uh, he, he waved a Socialist Party membership book, this was at Madison Square Garden, a, in the air and invited uh, Roosevelt to join, right? And he started talking about, he started in private conversation calling the Socialist Party our second mortgage. It was more of a burden than anything else. And by that time, it's really excluding them from any real, real, real role in electoral politics in New York. But they notice, ah, New York has this system we've been talking about. We can have our political cake and we can eat it too. We can organize our own party. Uh, we don't have to join the Democrats, which besides meaning Tammany meant white Southern supremacists, mm. white, Southern white supremacists, excuse me. And um, we don't have to join the Republican party, which uh, has its liberal wing in New York, but also is the party of big business. We can have our own labor party. Um, we can have our own labor party, uh, but we can support uh, Roosevelt. Uh, we can support Governor Lehman, who's also a Democrat, but we can support the biggest new dealer in New York who was nominally a Republican and that was LaGuardia at the same time. And if no one meets our needs, we can run our own candidates, right? So they formed a party called the American Labor Party which despite its grand name uh, was only in New York state, right? The American Labor Party. Um, and they supported Roosevelt and they supported LaGuardia. Uh, people, this is a little known fact, but you heard it here uh, that LaGuardia actually after 1936 re-enrolled as a member of the American Labor Party. And so after that, he was no longer a Republican. 
he actually, he ran with Republican support still because they had nowhere else to go, but actually he was no longer a member of the Republican party after 1936, he was a laborite. Something strange happens. Um, the, there's something called the Popular Front, which uh, is decreed from Moscow, which says that communist parties should no longer talk about revolution and uh, social fascists and things like this, but should make alliances with liberals, with uh, social democrats, with socialists against fascism. And in New York, the communists say, well, actually the ALP, the American Labor Party is a perfect vehicle for this. And so they move into the American Labor Party. As Micha mentioned, they fought it out for a number of years. As long as they had the same general politics, no one you know, cared that much. And actually the, the um, sorry, my phone is about to ring, not in time. Uh, the, uh, the, um, these anti-communist social Democrats in charge of the American Labor Party don't want to admit that the con there's many communists in their party, you know, and as long as the communists are going along, it's fine. During the Hitler-Stalin pact is the first real explosion of factional trouble in the ALP, right? But then when Germany attacks the Soviet Union, the communists fall back in line. Uh, but then in 1943-44, something happens, which is they win the primaries. That is the communists, in league with Sidney Hillman and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers win the primaries and take control of the ALP. And so the anti-communist Social Democrats say, that's it, we leave, right? And Dubinsky, David Dubinsky, the head of the ILG says, Hillman, you know, he didn't like it anyway. They were rivals, you know, uh, says, you know, Hillman may play around with the communists, but I never will. And they, and they split and they form the Liberal Party. So I wanted to bring that prehistory in. For a while, the ALP and the Liberal parties coexist, competing for a similar uh, base. But the ALP is, you know, partly falls victim to McCarthyism, but also partly to the, you know, the communists. After all, lose interest in. After a while, lose interest in it because it no longer serves their purpose, and so they kind of um, it falls by the wayside. Uh, but the liberals continue, and they continue to to um, serve an important function. And they do have this real base. They have the garment unions, they have the ILG, they have the Hatters Union, they have other unions. They can mobilize thousands of people for rallies at Madison Square Garden. They can bring out union members to, to work in elections. As Micha mentioned, they can actually, in some elections in some neighborhoods, um, they're the second party. At least sometimes they win elections locally. Uh, but they play a very important role. And, so we, and it's always in, it was, you know, at the leadership, the chair of the party was always a Gentile intellectual, a professor or a minister. The guys who were really wielding the power uh, were Yiddish accented trade unionists. Um, they had other, you know, other people in the party. But if you look at the county committees, mm -hmm. and I did on a case counted names, so it's a very rough estimate. But if you go by names, and if I knew who someone was, uh, you know, it's like ninety percent Jewish, a few uh, blacks, you know, some Italians, um, but really it was mainly a Jewish party. So that's that's the backstory. By the nineteen yeah. sixties, a couple of things are happening. One is that this base is moving out of the city, the Jewish population is declining. Uh, the other thing is that the garment industry is declining and the, these unions are declining. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, and uh, another thing is that, well, along with the first things, the demographic change, new groups are coming in, becoming more important and the Liberal Party never quite gains a foothold. They try sometimes, but they never, really bring in Blacks and, uh, and Puerto Ricans in a real strong way into the party in the 60s. Um, and another th and the final thing is that the nature of liberalism is changing. And there are issues, of course, in the 60s, like the Vietnam War, uh, which is tearing 
liberalism apart, right? Liberals apart. And that that affects the Liberal Party as well. And so, you know, it starts to, um, you know, have a hard time. Uh, but this is not, you, you start to notice this, I think, really in the 70s. Well, let me stop you there before we, we jump completely into that period, because uh, I, I thought you did a, a, a wonderful job um, really illuminating the, uh, the way that uh, the cracks in, in liberalism, the, the liberalism of the 60s, both on the domestic and foreign fronts, um, accentuated and, and, and created uh, you know, new splits. Uh, it wasn't just generational in terms of the the new left against the old left, um, but um, uh, very much ethnic and racial division. The uh, the ways that the the conflict over um, rising demands uh, for racial justice uh, collided with. Um, the feelings of white ethnics, including Jews, uh, about crime. Um, and then the fight over the Ocean Hill Brownsville uh, community control of local schools and how that became a huge flashpoint, uh, breaking uh, a lot of the Black Jewish alliance um, that had existed over civil rights elsewhere, but not necessarily so close to home. Um, and that the Liberal Party absolutely was caught in the maw of that too. Um, I think you pointed out that Albert Shanker, uh, the head of the, the teachers union at the time was a Liberal Party member. Um, and uh, uh, the party did not have the capacity to hold these disparate uh, uh, and, uh, you know, very hard to hold those kinds of demands in one place, uh, even though John Lindsay, its mayor, had done at least earlier in the, uh, when the first round of, of riots happened, 64-65, uh, he successfully uh, negotiated, uh, you know, a, a degree of calm. New York didn't have the same kinds of riots that you saw in other cities across the North. Um, but by the late 60s, there was no holding this together. Um, I, and that's when, by the way, you know, starting around 1965, I think is when the, the degree to which the Liberal Party is primarily dependent on patronage really comes to the fore. And I, I also wanted to just say, you know, the archival research that you did, um, uh, you know, discovering in the old records of the party, you know, literally uh, memos from its executive director telling people exactly how to talk about and not talk about, uh, you know, getting the jobs from, you know, whichever mayor typically, or sometimes governor uh, that it had supported and then was owed. Um, how to talk about it, how not to talk about it. It's quite blatant and, and um, delicious to see. Um, I was, you know, one of the things that um, I'm, I'm curious if you wanted to talk about a bit the role of media in both either holding the party together with its base or causing it to lose its connection to its base, because it was striking to me to see how much the forward played a kind of organic role of, uh, it wasn't quite the house organ of the party, but it was read uh, by much of the Jewish community in New York and was pretty influential. Um, it's really interesting to see not just the way that that community starts to outgrow its first generation connection uh, to social democracy to things like the Labor Party uh, as the, the uh, people begin to prosper. Um, you know, the first generation of immigrant Jews whose children then got to go to places like City College 
I'm now literally thinking of my dad, uh, you know, on the GI Bill, going and then getting a degree in education so that he could teach in the public schools. But that was that's a white collar profession, um, very different than, than garment work. Um, and then later, obviously, uh, as the quota system in uh, the Ivy Leagues elsewhere uh, started to uh, get torn down, more Jews move into the higher earning professions and they also start moving to the suburbs. And you get, instead of the forward as their you know, uh, home base, you get things like the Village Voice. And the Village Voice, um, I mean, the writers of the Village Voice are, are, are sort of in the background of your story, though they are the people, the very much the people who were interpreting, I think for a big audience, um, what liberal with a small L politics should mean. And they were fiercely critical of the liberal party and probably you know, did the most work in uncovering a lot of the corruption that started to flow from the patronage uh, dependence that the party had. Um, you're nodding your head. I, I, I assume you agree with this, with this interpretation. Um, and I think that the weakening of the party, do you think it was inevitable? Or do you think it could have, that there might've been a different path for the liberal party? I guess this would be, you know, uh, and I should tell our uh, audience to start putting their questions into the Q&A box. But did the liberal party have to end up the way it did with, you know, uh, uh, Alex Rose as a kingmaker, as long as he could, wielding that control of the ballot line quite strategically up to a point and then beginning to falter. And then when he goes, the next generation, Ray Harding, trying to hold it together, but ultimately, you know, it, it truly does become a law firm with a ballot line. Do you think it was inevitable? Could the Liberal Party have developed differently in your view? Was it too, too top down, for example? Or is this just when you get a ballot line in New York, somebody's got to, you know, kind of be in charge? Uh, I don't know if it was inevitable. But there was um, some, they would have had to have done things very differently, let's put it that way, in order for it to survive. It would have had to have evolved, you know, considerably. Um, it would have had to, um, as I kind of implied before, it would have had to say the, you know, the city is changing, the issues are changing. And we have to bring in new people, not only into the party, but into the leadership. And they weren't so good at that. Um, they they made efforts, you know, I mean, they made some efforts. There were some clubs uh, in Harlem or, in, uh, you know, East Harlem, uh, Latino clubs in East Harlem. They had for a while a Latino organizer on staff. Um, so they made some, and also things like Local 22 and the ILG had a very diverse membership. So they made some effort but not nearly enough. And um, and you don't really see it in the leadership of the party so much. Uh, uh, you see this also, by the way, in the ILGWU, which is a parallel kind of development, uh, you know, very active in civil rights efforts and so on, uh, but not very good at integrating new groups into leadership positions in the, in the union in one case and in the party in the other case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think as it as it was in the '60s, uh, there were some young people who came into the party, uh, but they became kind of uh, uh, frustrated with it, um, partly because they didn't see it reflecting um, what they saw as what liberalism should be. Um, some of it had to do with the Vietnam War, which the party eventually did oppose, which frustrated some of the people in the party that actually supported the war effort. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it would have had to have really made a stronger effort to, to change its uh, composition and its leadership. The other thing that you mentioned is patronage. Um, 
from the very beginning, one of the things that the party did quite self-consciously was put, you know, it wasn't going to elect a lot of people on its own. Once in a while it did, but not very often. Uh, so one of the things it did was it, it put its people in positions of power through appointments by major party politicians who it supported, right? Um, and, you know, some people raised their eyebrows about this from the very beginning, but Alex Rose, who was the head of the Hatters Union, and he was officially a vice chair of the party, but he was really one of the two or three people who ran it, and eventually the person who ran it. <laughs> um, he always said, what's wrong with that? Like, we have good people. And what not that what a political party exists to do, to put its people into positions of influence and to influence things for the better. And that's what we do. And so that's what they did. Um, you mentioned a letter from Ben Davidson, who was the executive director of the party, uh, to the upstate director, um, where he, he chided him for using the wrong word. He goes, the upstate director, Angelo Cordaro, said, um, you know, we get patronage. And he said, no, no, we do not get patronage. That's a bad word. What we do is we ask for recognition. And we ask for our good people to be our good people to be put in positions of influence. Um, but in the 1960s, uh, two things were happening. One is, as I, as I kind of implied before, they had fewer people. The second was they had more power, uh, especially with the Lindsay administration. They had helped to elect Ma uh, Mayor John Lindsay in 1965. And actually after 1969, he won re-election uh, really almost solely on their line because he had lost the Republican primary. So they had a lot of influence and a lot of patronage and fewer people. And uh, another kind of thing I got from an insider in person, Ed Morrison, who was deputy mayor under Lindsay and, and, and had been before that Manhattan chair of the Liberal Party says, you know, he starts, people start showing up, you know, at his doorstep and they say, Alex sent me, you know, and Alex sent me in for a job. And he would say, who are you? I never saw you in the Liberal Party before. And there's always that, no, Alex sent me, right? And he goes to Alex and says, Alex, what's the difference between us and, and Tammany Hall if this is what we're about? And Alex said, no, you know, he stuck to his line. No, we have good people. But, you know, one of the things that had happened in the 60s was that David Dubinsky retired from his position as head of the ILGWU and the new president, Stolberg, you know, there were real political issues about Vietnam, about um, supporting Republicans or not supporting Republicans, but also like a personal thing. Stolberg, the Liberal Party was Dubinsky's baby. And so Stolberg was gonna do everything opposite. And he took, gradually detached the ILGWU from the Liberal Party. The ILGWU, uh, supplied a lot of the money for the Liberal Party. So they had to find other sources of money as well. And actually they started to hit up office holders, you right. know, um, and so- Members or, or donors. Yeah, and so this becomes uh, kind of almost the raison, raison d'etre for the party. Uh, Alex Rose, this was under Alex Rose, but you know, he's, he maintained this connection to the old, you know, kind of labor, and socialist kind of milieu. He was actually a labor Zionist. So he was kind of a socialist, but, but um, you know, he kind of maintained this. But once he died at the end of 1976, this kind of starts, I mean, this kind of falls apart. And um, one of the great things that you mentioned the archives, in addition to this letter by Ben, Dav uh, ben Davidson from earlier, but in 1982, I found three memos uh, by, um, I always forget his name, Tim Russer, who was later on TV, right? But he- Moynihan he, aide at the time. Right, he was a Moynihan aide. And mm -hmm. so he was negotiating for Moynihan with the Liberal Party for liberal support in 1982 when Moynihan was running for re-election. And basically the liberals are asking for three things. One A, we need money because we're gonna run an independent campaign on your behalf. So we need money from you to do that. One B, we need money because we have our own overhead and we need you know, help with that. Right. Two, we need to know that our people will be considered for positions for which they are eminently qualified and which they're you know, good people. And 
three, we kind of disagree on school vouchers, you know, vouchers for, for private school attendance. Uh, but that one we can negotiate on that one we can work out, right? Yeah. And um, so you need to take X number of seats for the annual gala and you need to do this, you know, make contributions. Um, and Russell actually says, I, you know, I just want to make, make this clear that the Liberal Party support is not for sale. And Harding says, you're right, it's not for sale, but this is what we need. Mm. And Moynihan is at the last meeting and he says, um, this is all paraphrasing, but he says, you know, you know, now I understand, you know, when, when Alex Rose was live, no one asked me be, be for these things, but now I understand what the, what the rules are. Uh, he, got the, he got the nomination. Um, but by the 1980s, this is what it starts to be. Uh, Rose retired also Ben Davidson, the executive director who was an old communist, former ex-communist turned loves tonight, which was a right, they were right deviationists. Um, you know, uh, the, they all had these connections to this old left-wing milieu. Davidson always wrote the party platform, uh, but this, they're kind of dying out or retiring and there's a huge fight over the party, but Harding wins. And he's less interested in these things, you know? He's yeah. more interested in playing the game. Um, yeah. And that's basically well, what happens by the 1980s. Right. That's pretty clear. Right, right. It, it um, sort of la last major topic, and then we'll try and go to some of the questions in the chat. Um, uh, the decline of, of the Liberal Party, uh, uh, I mean, it takes a while for it to die. Um, and it's uh, to those of us who have suffered with uh, the Cuomo dynasty for the last couple of decades, it's sort of fun and interesting to see how the liberals intersected with the rise of both Cuomo's father and son, um, and ultimately die, you know, the, the last candidate they nominated for governor was Andrew Cuomo, who then withdrew uh, back in 2002 because uh, he knew he wasn't even going to get anywhere. Um, and that's when they had, you know, finally expire, literally. Um, the And then we get the, the rise of the Working Families Party uh, congruent uh, in the late 90s. And so what I, I uh, just putting to side the degree to which History doesn't repeat itself, but it does sometimes rhyme. Um, because I, you know, it was very interesting to, you know, as someone who did spend a fair amount of time um, in the 80s and 90s as uh, pieces of the New Left, the Rainbow Coalition, Bernie Sanders, others were hunting for some way to create a viable progressive third party, initially called the New Party. Um, and then uh, when the New Party's attempt to legalize fusion through a legal strategy um, that went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, and, and was cut down uh, painfully um, uh, by a majority that included liberals like Stephen Breyer, may he leave the court soon. Um, uh, the, we thought that move was over, and then the, the Working Families Party arises as this one new potential, uh, basically trying to be what the Liberal Party wasn't. By the time the Liberal Party dies, no one thinks of it as liberal anymore. I mean, even endorsing someone like Moynihan, I was uh, amused to see that at, at one point uh, the Liberal Party helped support Betsy McCoy. Uh, I didn't know she was once a liberal. I, I only think of her now as as a Trumpite. But um, uh, uh, but hey, the Working Families Party helped Eva Moskowitz get her start in politics too. So I guess everybody can make a mistake now and then. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, you know, your thoughts about lessons uh, from the Liberal Party's success and failure for the Working Families Party. Um, and just, I, I do see we have a question there from William Herbert uh, in the audience about the Working Families Party and how it would compare. And I would just say, my read is that number one, the Working Families Party started 
in a very different way um, than the, uh, the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party comes out of this kind of mass ferment of the 1920s and 30s um, when you have a huge working class in New York. Um, you still have a big industrial base in New York. Um, and and you, you end up with a lot of very politicized unions and members uh, looking for an expression of their values and, and their needs. Working Families Party comes along at the end of the 90s and is, I would argue, a coalition of a bunch of unions, public interest groups, ACORN, maybe its most uh, strong roots in, in terms of the Black poor. Um, but it's a, it's a collection of separate pieces that are all each on their own week, um, including some significant labor unions like 1199. Now we're, while the garment workers have declined, things like the, the service workers and the hospitals, they are now uh, the big players along with the communications workers um, and very, very important involved in the founding of, of the Working Families Party at a moment of weakness. You know, this is uh, the Pataki years, if I'm remembering correctly. You know, Republicans are now dominant and not the kind of liberal Republicans that, you know, Rockefeller, et cetera, represented, but a much more Reaganite kind of republicanism um, that is all about, you know, cutting taxes and, and uh, cutting services uh, and, you know, basically uh, screw the poor. Um, the Working Families Party is a kind of inside this smaller milieu, uh, a, a really smart tactical move. They look at the Liberal Party, which isn't delivering anything liberal anymore, and they say, "Why don't we have one of those? <laughs> you know, we could just get a ballot line. We just need fifty thousand votes." Um, and they just manage, by the skin of their teeth, to do that by endorsing Peter Vallone, a total hack, who nobody expected was going to win in the governor's race. He was willing to take their support, and and indeed, Working Families Party gets its line, which it's managed to protect ever since. But it's a different beast. It isn't, it, it, it doesn't have an Alex Rose, it doesn't have a single person around which all the power is congealed. It's more, it's got an executive committee with a lot of different players on it. It's dominated by labor. And then the other thing that's different about the Working Families Party is it has a more explicit mission, I think, than the Liberal Party, which is move the Democrats to the left. It's very clear about that. And it exists to strategically mobilize progressives wherever possible to pull the Democrats to the left. It hardly ever puts up its own candidates. It's most of the time leveraging that ballot line in, in strategic ways. And then its nemesis is, is the Cuomo dynasty, is you know the power and money in New York that's congealed around uh, Cuomo and Cuomo goes, you know, they go to war. And it looks like, uh, well, we can see which one survived uh, as of now. Um, but Cuomo in the process of trying to defeat the Working Families Party, uses his power over state budgets. It's kind of patronage too, right? Which is, you know, he controls important budgets over things like the hospitals and so on. And so those unions can't cross him. They have a much harder time uh, when he says, you know, who are you loyal to? And so today's Working Families Party is different than the one that started out 25 years ago because it really doesn't have the same base in big labor unions that it had at the beginning. And I think that's one of its challenges right now is whether it can continue in an environment where, you know, the left's 
may be bigger thanks to Bernie Sanders. You know, the mass base seems to be potentially there, but it isn't as unified. What are, what are your thoughts on, on the comparison with the WFP? Um, well, so I think you, you, you pair them very well. I think in some ways they're similar, right? In, in the sense that the Working Families Party attempted and, and I think has kind of filled that kind of left of center niche in this minor party, major party constellation, uh, and that it is based in, in, or it was at least based in labor, um, in the labor movement. Uh, but of course, it's a different time. Right. And so the issues are different, the constituencies are different. And as you pointed out, one thing that's very different in New York is that when the Liberal Party was around, you know, in its, in its heyday, um, it was pulling the Democrats and the Republicans to the left. It was playing them off against each other. And this is kind of not really possible anymore. Um, so, so there's all kinds of different, um, you know, different circumstances, different people, different experiences, you know, obviously, um, you know, people coming out of whether it was, you know, the 1960s or 70s or 80s have different experiences going into it than the people coming out of the 1920s and 30s. And so the concerns are very different. I did once talk to a, this was, you know, not uh, formal or anything like that. It's, it's not in the book, but one important person in the Working Families Party did tell me that the Liberal Party is their nightmare, uh, was their nightmare, and that they would, you know, that they would end up like the Liberal Party. Uh -huh. And one of the things that they did to, to forestall that is not to take patronage positions. Hmm. I don't know if that's still true or not. This was a number of years ago, but that that was almost like a decision that they weren't going to take the Liberal Party route of intentionally, you know, putting their people into into appointed jobs um, in in return right. for support. I I I um I know there are probably some Working Families Party people watching. Um, I think that's true. Uh, I think it's also true that what the Working Families Party has done, which is quite shrewd, is it has developed an expertise in grassroots campaigning, or what campaigns refer to as field organizing. Um, and um, it has made money uh, to support its organizers by, uh, in effect, um, getting paid to help the candidates it endorses win. Um, this is not, there's nothing corrupt about that. Um, campaigns have to hire organizers from somewhere. <laughs> um, labor unions used to supply and still do to some degree. Uh, 32BJ, for example, is an important union in New York politics that does supply field muscle uh, for the candidates, you know, it gets behind. Uh, today, that muscle would include digital forms of organizing as well. So um, I do think that one of the ways the WFP has uh, sustained itself financially has been through this capacity to get out the vote. Um, and it has probably been most effective when it's been able to focus on a special election, on a particular race, um, when, you know, in effect, it can bring a lot of organizers to bear. Um, it's harder to do that when you're in a, uh, a presidential year or, you know, where we're, um, it's not a single special election where everybody can focus. Um, I think there's also uh, another development which is important to the WFP's milieu, which didn't exist for the Liberal Party in any significant degree, which is the role of foundations and the role of uh, larger individual donors. I don't know, were you able to get access in your research to uh, you know, any details on the finances of the, of the Liberal Party in terms of not just unions, were, were there other sources of support or was it really dues coming from the big unions that were behind it? It's mainly the unions, uh, especially the ILGWU, but also the gala, the annual gala, uh -huh. 
was a big money maker, and you know because they were important and there would be important politicians there and and, and so on, it was a very important event for them. But doesn't I mean the other thing is is as television really overtakes uh, grassroots door to door politicking as the way you get the vote out, or at least as the way it's perceived. That's a much more expensive way to do politics now. Um, I mean, the war chests needed um, to succeed at the state level are in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, and I don't think the Liberal Party was ever anywhere in that in that kind of ballpark, right? Yeah, you mentioned media before. I mean, uh, there was also the New York Post that they were close to. Mm. And um, they and certainly did- a Liberal rate, paper, right? Yes. It was a Liberal yeah, paper. This was before Murdoch. Right. And um, especially James Wexler, yep. they were very close to, and uh, they did have um, radio spots, and they had you know radio stations like WEVD that they were close to. So um, they had radio Eugene spots. V. Debs, right? Eugene, Eugene V. Debs. Yes. Right. Um, and they, I think they had some. They may have had some TV spots. Uh, the the chair. Um, uh, was for a while was Donald Harry, the Reverend Donald Harrington, was the chair of the party, and he did a spot uh, for Cuomo, I believe it was, uh, for Mario uh, when he was running against Koch, um, and he got it kind of, it was a, he, he said at one point vote for, you know, uh, Cuomo, he's a real man and not a cutout, meaning Koch was like not like a kind of media or something not a real kind of person, you know, uh, but the editors edited that the last part out and they had Harrington say, vote for Koch, he's a real man. And I mean, vote for Cuomo, he's a real man. And Koch yeah. saw that as a kind of uh, homophobic slur. Harrington always denied it and was kind of a little bit embarrassed, you know, mm. embarrassed by it. But that's that was one example where I think they did have a TV spot. Right. So I want to turn to um, with the last 15 minutes that we have here to the questions that folks should add to the list here. Um, so I, there's a question from Joseph Mendez, just didn't the actual votes on the Liberal Party line come mainly from persons who had little or no knowledge of the party platform? They just like the name liberal, I, I guess, is what he's suggesting. I think that was uh, sometimes true and more and more true as time went on. Mm -hmm. uh, and people had this, you know, kind of vague notion it was liberal, and so it was kind of a, uh, a stamp of approval, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that was true at first, although, you know, you'd also say, there are some people who said, look, the, the unions told their people to go out and vote liberal, so the people voted liberal without really paying that much attention to it either. Uh, but I think, um, you know, at first it was very much part of a whole constellation of institutions and movements and things. Uh, but even somewhere in the middle, you know, and certainly towards the end, it was kind of a name, you know, you say, well, the Liberal Party endorsed this candidate, so they must be okay. So I think it became more and more true. Mm -hmm. It also, it, there's a question from Jerry here uh, related to the Liberal Party being a way for Republicans to vote um, uh, Republican candidates needed the Liberal Party because voters who were alive during the New, New Deal would never vote Republican. Yes, I mean, I think that you, you've made that point um, that for people like Lindsey, Javits, and so on, um, the, you know, you didn't have to hold your nose and vote for Rockefeller as a Republican, you could vote for him as a liberal. I just want to say one thing, they never supported Rockefeller. Uh, that's right, that's my mistake. But but they did support Javits and they did uh, support Lindsay and they got hundreds of thousands of votes for these candidates. So they, this wasn't, you know, um, kind of negligible support that they huh. supported. And Javits was running statewide as a, well, they, did, they didn't support him at the beginning of his state right career. They supported him in 68, 74 and 80. But Lindsay, like for a mayor, a Republican could not get elected mayor in New York City without basically outflanking the Democrat from the left. And there were liberal Republicans and they could outflank the um, Democrats from the left, but they needed that 
that's stamp of approval. Well, as we let's talk before. about that. Let's talk about that famous liberal Republican Rudy Giuliani. Um, uh, there's a question here from Daniel Cantor, uh, who was uh, the the founding director of the Working Families Party. Um, was there internal Liberal Party opposition to the Giuliani endorsements, resignation of members? Yeah, talk to us a bit about the 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 so, relationship with Giuliani. So in 1989. Uh, Giuliani, who had been, as people know, a federal you know, prosecutor, thinking of running for mayor. Um, Koch was running for re-election. Uh, he had a challenger in the Democratic primary, David Dinkins. Uh, and Giuliani reached out to the Liberal Party, as Republicans had to do, traditionally, uh, to win in New York City. Now, you know, Giuliani actually had some like positive image among liberals uh, because he had gone after Wall Street malfeasance as a prosecutor. And actually, Jack Newfield had written positively about him and, and was kind of inclined to um, write positively about him. Um, and they all assumed that he would be running against Koch. And uh, they had had a falling out with Koch and they had never backed Koch for mayor. But um, so they, you know, they talked with Giuliani and Giuliani was going to do a kind of middle of the road, kind of out, you know, Koch talked very much from the right, even though he didn't always govern from the right. right. So um, they were gonna outflank Koch from the left again with Giuliani and a surprising thing happened, which is that Dinkins beat Koch in the primary. And so Giuliani emerged as a law and order uh, candidate uh, you know, running from the right against Dinkins, uh, but with liberal support. But by that time, the Liberal Party was not much of a party. That was, I mean, it was already quite clear and um, it didn't make that much of a difference to them. Um, they did, you know, push him to the left on things like gay rights. Um, marriage was not on the table, but I don't think he ever even supported um, domestic partnership rights, but certainly, they pushed him on more support for AIDS, uh, for support with people with AIDS and for services and so on. Um, and to be at least kind of quiet on things like abortion, you know? So they did push him to be more liberal on some things, um, but it didn't really matter to them that much by that time, I don't think, most of them. I don't think there were ma not many resignations because there, there weren't many people to resign. Yes, at this point, I mean, and I think, you know, and, and there's a second question here from Dan Cantor. Did they feel badly that nominating Javits gave us D'Amato instead of Holtzman? Um, I guess the, the assumption here is that there were a they to feel bad. Um, In 1980, there still were some people, you know, and uh, they, their feeling was that they had, Javits was their guy, they had supported him, he had done what they wanted, and you don't, Actually, Henry Stern told me, he said, you don't dump someone when he's been perfectly fine. You know, you, you endorse him. And of course, they didn't know he was going to lose the Republican primary either. Yes. But they stuck Henry, with him. Henry Stern, by the way, we should take a moment on Henry Stern because he is still alive, probably uh, spent the longest time in office thanks to uh, having been in the Liberal Party. Um, you got to speak with him. I, I take it you interviewed him for the book. Uh, what are his thoughts on on the Liberal Party's rise and fall? Um, I mean, is he embarrassed? Uh, proud? He's not easily embarrassed. So you know, <laughs> he's a character. I know. Yeah, it was hard to read him on that, right? I think he felt like, you know, he was actually when I talked to him in the twenty first century, he was still um, nominally. He had agreed to be the chair, you know, of the Liberal Party. What was left of it was pretty much just a web, a web uh, site. But um, you know, I think by that time he realized it was gone. Um, you know, I think I'll, I will say one thing, which is that he got involved in the Liberal Party along with some other people of his generation. First of all, uh, they got involved first when they were very, very young, like students, like even high, high school students or college students uh, in the 50s, but then also in the 60s, when they were both more ideologically 
kind of more ideologically driven than the reform Democrats you mentioned at one point today, mm. um, but also more pragmatic at the same time. And they felt like the, the reform Democrats both were kind of just very fuzzy on what they thought but also always mired in factional squabbles. And the Liberal Party had some discipline and kind of knew what it was about. And I think that was one of the appeals for people like um, Henry Stern. He did also tell me that he, you know, he was living, living in Washington Heights and he, you know, he visited the Democratic Club and it was an old line Democratic Club and it was these old guys and this Jewish young man, you know, lawyer walks in and he just didn't feel comfortable. So he felt much more comfortable in in the in the Liberal Party culturally, um, and, culturally. Mm -hmm. and he did also end up working, I believe, um, briefly for Matthew Levy as a law clerk who was a judge, who had been an old socialist who was in the Liberal Party, um, you know, and and ended up working uh, on a number of positions through the Liberal Party. In our last few minutes, I want to ask you a, a question about. Um the degree to which New York is still a, a place where the type of uh, patronage, temptations, um, or other forms of, of political corruption uh, can still fester. Um, you know, the, the degree, we, we do have a question in the chat here about the, the, the role of the Liberal Party in picking judges. Um, the way we get judges in New York still seems to be tied up with party nominations that are uh, tightly controlled by county committees. And um, I, I experienced this as recently as a few years ago, uh, was out on election night, Democratic primary between Alessandra Biagi and Jeff Klein. Klein, very powerful state senator who Democrat caucusing with the Republican Party in the state Senate, um, and Biagi, who is not at all like her grandfather, um, running as, as a real reform Democrat, ultimately beats him. We're standing on the street corner watching people come and go as they vote, and there's a young woman standing there holding flyers for Klein, a young Puerto Rican woman. And I asked her, what are you doing here? Why are you supporting Klein? And she says, well, I, uh, I belong to the Ben Franklin Club, which used to be a Reform Democratic Club in the Bronx in Riverdale, still a very Jewish community. But they told me, I work at the courthouse, and they told me it would be good for my career if I came and helped Klein. And this was just five years ago. So it seems to me that some of that environment is still very much with us and, and has its, you know, the, the machine, whatever it is you want to call it, whether it, it's Democrat, liberal, or something else, um, still plays a role in, in our political process. Is that right? Um, yeah. So as you described it, <laughs> I think it's harder for the parties to make deals because of the open primaries and, um, you know, it's a little harder to predict in the early years of the Liberal Party, uh, even though I think primaries were possible, but they didn't happen as often. And so it was easier for, you know, party leaders to make the kind of deals that they made. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a little harder now, but like judgeships especially are still like, the, you know, among the last bastions of this kind of kind of thing, I think, especially. Right. Especially when the electorate isn't paying attention which is often the case. It was not the case right. in that particular primary because a lot of people came out um, uh, to throw Klein out of office. Uh, we're just about out of time. I'm, um, and I, I think we got to most of the questions that we have here. We could keep going. This was really fun. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go over. Uh, I, I want to just say, um, I'm pretty sure that under the, uh, Geneva Convention for the Humane Treatment of Authors, that if you're in the presence of an author, uh, uh, Article 2 of the convention says that if you're in the presence of an author on the uh, appearance of his new book and you hear them speak about it, you have to go buy it. Um, and I strongly recommend 
that you go out and do that. If you've, you've been with us tonight, um, maybe Peter can share again the discount code uh, for the book. Um, uh, it's really a, a great tour uh, through a very important and, and somewhat neglected part of New York's history, uh, as well as Jewish history, as well as left history. Um, and it has a lot of resonance for to today. So uh, Daniel, I really thank you for putting in the time to unearth the full story and, and give us a chance to talk about it together. Thank you very much. I heartily second those comments and we have shared the code, the discount code for uh, uh, Daniel Sawyer's uh, new book, which you should all certainly go out and purchase. Um, in the chat, but if you uh, are somehow unable to get it, you can reach out, write to us at the Gotham Center, gothamcenter.org. You can find our contact information. I want to thank both of you for joining us tonight. I want to remind our audience that I want to thank you for coming. Remind our audience that we'll be meeting back again on March, uh, the evening of March 17th, to be talking about um, Ben Holtzman's new book uh, uh, for an event entitled After the Fiscal Crisis, New York City's Path to Neoliberalism which has some overlap with tonight's discussion. Uh, and on that uh, score, I will um, say good evening to you all and thank you again to our guests. Please join me in uh, silently applauding our excellent guest tonight for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.